Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Cymatic Seminar. The seminar will be presented by Dr. Peter Guy Manners of England, who is co-founder and director of Brett Fortin Trust and is a medical director of Brett Fortin Hall Clinic. And he will be discussing and giving you more detailed information on the cymatics equipment. So I now present Dr. Peter Guy Manners. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope we've moved the temperature down so you won't get too hot in here. When we came in, it was empty. It was just like an oven, but I think we've succeeded in getting it down a bit. We can't manage it ourselves. In the UK, we have little knobs and we twiddle, but there were no knobs on any of these things, so we had to go and get some help. Now, I want to keep the um, talk as much as I can into the practical level, um, because I want to explain the workings and details of the instrumentation and its way of functioning and working. But first of all, I'm going to sort of give you some of the, shall I say, theory, because I think this is necessary. Um, it's no good sort of stepping uh, up at the top of the ladder. We must stop at the start at the bottom and gradually work up. Otherwise, we get a rather confused idea of what it's all about. When you get to the, shall I say, the top of the ladder on this, you find that basically it is um, quite simple. But the point is, if you don't start at the bottom, you're a bit at a loss by the time you get to the top. Uh, so without blinding you with science and a lot of medical jargon, I'll try to get it as near and as possibly can into a condensed form. So you'll have to excuse me, I'm going to read this little bit before I go into my own bat. I always like just to talk and not to read. But I think for theory purposes, it's best to read. Um, On some of these uh, seminars, when we do many all around the world, we are asked sometimes to give a sort of, um, what would you call it, a theory, something to start the conference off with. And um, although I'm not a poet or anything of that, and please don't misunderstand me, uh, sometimes when I sit down, uh, very peculiar sort of things come into my mind. And one of these I've got in front of me. So if you want to giggle afterwards, you can. Uh, but for what it's worth, I'm going to read it to you. The dimensions of men, the mystery of life, the trend of existence, the stupendous secrets which are locked from our view behind the gates of birth and death, send out their silent challenge with the radiations of every star on the hushed breath of space itself. Over the passage of time, thousands of mighty minds have wrestled with the secret of their own existence and have made an effort to explain the mysterious source of their own existence and all that is around them. These statements stand out like powerful beams on a dark sky. Space, time, force, matter have been the basis of their vast number of theories and most of them brilliant and intriguing, and most of them in complete and utter disagreement with each other. I can never resist, resist putting a, I was going to say, a spoke in the last sentence. Otherwise, they think I'm getting too much, too poetical, you see, and that's not my train of thought. Physics teach us that all magnetic materials must have a bipolar configuration. They must have a north pole as well as a south pole, and it is evident that if two opposite poles are facing each other, that attraction occurs, whereas repulsion is the result when two similar poles face each other. One British research physicist, however, 
Dr. H. Tomlinson, claims that there are polar fields developed in all directions around a magnet. These fields, he asserts, may extend several feet, fading as distance from the magnet increases. Tomlinson speaks of the total field surrounding a magnet as being comprised of various rays, each of which can be detected in a specific area around the magnet. If Tomlinson's assessment is correct, it would appear that the detailed composition of a magnetic field is far more complex than the simple bipolar structures as popularly understood in physics. Now, according to some of our previous discussions, all matter is understood to have a rate of vibration which is peculiar to itself, notwithstanding that it may be imperceptible to normal human faculties or even to the detection by scientific instrumentation. To have a rate for vibration is to have a rhythmical pattern of reoccurring periods wherein the energy of the vibration changes from one value to another. In such a situation, the frequency of a system is said to oscillate or to exhibit rhythmic variations between certain maximum values. All matter, all freely vibrating systems are conceived as having their own natural frequencies or periods of free oscillation. This constitutes systems native vibration in an unobstructed state, i.e., without the influence of an outside compelling vibratory force. Resonance is said to occur when the respective periods of free oscillation of two or more different systems coincide with each other. If the two independent systems both having the same natural occurring frequency, they are joined together in phase. Resonance occurs with a result that their maximum and minimum values are reached simultaneously. Both systems vibrate in unison, and under these conditions, the resultant wavelength values created by the union of the two frequencies exceed that which either could produce independently. Now, that sounds an awful lot of rigmarole, and uh, all these scientific things, when you try to explain them in this, seems a lot of jargon, but it's essential for you to understand that and precisely what it means. Now, I'm not stating that you don't know what on earth I've been talking about, although sometimes when I read these things, I have to read them about six times before I really know what it's about. And I like to put it into ordinary common or garden language. The two systems we are referring to is one is the system of the human anatomy, which is vibrating at a certain rate, which is an overall rate of the body itself. But alongside of that, you have every part of the structure in internal organs, which is also vibrating in harmonic unison with each other. It all interrelates with each other, but the vibrationary <coughs> force field must be different with each of them. Otherwise, what would happen is that you'd have one interrelating or working in with the other. Without going too much into the intricate details, this is what happens with a growth or with cancer. The vibrationary force field of, we we'll say, the offending cell has a vibration which can interrelate with some organ or some part of the human anatomy and structure. And if that part is weakened by any means whatsoever, then it will eventually work its way in and take over. Now that is basically what all that uh, paragraph is really explaining or telling you. Now let's go on to the instrumentation's point in it. Resonance necessarily involves an exchange between systems, a kind of mutual sensing. In most cases, 
two vibrating systems interact, one becomes dominant and the other moves to the frequency of the dominant one. But once resonance is achieved, there is continual and maximum energy exchange between the two systems. Professor Olive Reichler, in his book Cosmic Humanism, refers to the British investigator and researcher Ninian Marshall, who has postulated a theory of holistic resonance. Dr. Marshall asserts that any two structures exert a mutual vibrationary influence upon each other which tends to make them become alike. He further states that the strength of this influence increases with the product of their complexities and decreases with the difference between their patterns. Now here again, I would like to explain this in just common or garden words and make it easier. We have now, over the period of approximately 20 years, been able to evaluate the resonant value of most of the organs and parts of anatomy and structure. <coughs> this has been a very long and a very difficult job to do. We know basically the resonant frequency of the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, muscles, bones, whatever. These are now all listed and are supplied with every instrument. Now, if you have, we we'll say, Let's take the lung, for instance. If you have problem in your lung, whatever it may be, let's not deal on medical details, but you've got something wrong with a the lung, then the frequency field within that lung will be disharmonic. <coughs> in other words, it will be out of alignment. Yes, did you want to? A brief question. When you say frequency, in this case, are you talking magnetic, electronic, sound, or? or sound. Sound. We're dealing only with sound. If I deal anything other than sound, I will, I will state it, okay? The frequency then would be disorientated. It would be out of alignment with the natural frequency that should exist there. Now, if we can create, <coughs> excuse me, if we can create an artificial vibration that is an exact alignment with a healthy tissue and structure, amplify it many, many thousands of times, and literally play it back into the structure, one or other of those frequencies has to move. They can't both exist together. So let me read that in the more technical way again to you. To assert that any two structures exert a mutual vibrationary influence upon each other, which tends to make them become more alike. It is further stated that the strength of this influence increases with the product of their complexities and decreases with the difference between their patterns. If there is nothing wrong with the lung and we transmit transplant, transfer, all these terms are being used by various doctors, now they understand the thing. So it doesn't matter which expression you use. But if you transfer the artificial frequency into a lung that has nothing wrong with it whatsoever, it will pass aside. It will do no harm, create no damage, no interference, it will not do anything at all. It will merely pass straight through and out the other side. Now, if in the passage of that complex pattern into the lung, there is an abnormality caused by any means, that doesn't matter at the moment, caused by whatever it may be, then resonance is set up between the two opposing systems, and one has to give way. Now, the natural one, which has taken over within the lung will give way. Now, when I say the natural one, it is the one that is being created by the adverse condition in the lung. So, therefore, it is not in line with the natural harmonic of the lung. And what we are injecting or passing into the lung is the correct natural frequency that should exist there if the lung was normal and if it was healthy. 
and therefore one gives way to the other. In other words, we can literally pull it back into alignment. To emphasize this a little stronger, you all possibly remember, and I mentioned this uh, when we gave our first lecture, that Professor Bernard of South Africa, when he did his first transplants, did every single thing known to medical science to make sure that the heart was in complete agreement with the system. But at that particular time, which was a few years back now, and believe me, advanced techniques in medicine is moving very, very fast today, they didn't take into consideration the overall harmonic of the system. Now, it was unknown why it failed. And if you remember reading about it, you will note that it was always said that the body rejected the transplant. Now that terminology was used purely and simply because that's the only conclusion they could arrive at. But it was absolutely correct. The harmonic value of the transplanted organ did not fit into the harmonic values of the system. And the system being the stronger that it too overpowered the vibrationary pattern of the heart. Not that the heart failed, not that the heart was diseased, but it started to interfere with its vibrationary pattern. Well now that is all taken now into consideration. In every transplant now, this is part of the curriculum and the understanding that you must know the harmonics and test the harmonics beforehand. Yes, yes. This organ implants. That's right. Yes, yes. Through sound, are they? Yes, yes. They can do it through sound. They know what the frequencies are, and they can check and reset them to make sure that they are right. And if the harmonic value doesn't fit, then you will have to wait for another one until such one does. And by this, the rate of uh, success in transplants is moved up tremendously. I mean, we are mu there are much they, because I'm not, I don't work as a surgeon. It was much more successful. Yes, you have a question at the back there. Dr. Manning, you're referring to uh, European technique. I assume that's not regeneration that was done. Uh, European ah, harmonic. harmonically? Oh, yes, I think it is. it is. Yes, I think this is, what should I say, international now. I think <coughs> we're all sort of going along the same lines. You know, there's a strange thing about... Um, or should I say this movement into, I'm going to call it advanced medicine. I don't like any of those other silly expressions, advanced medicine. There is something about it which is very strange and very peculiar. Perhaps a lot of those people who understand uh, psychic science and all the rest of it could explain it. But it would appear that the concepts, the ideas, and these theories of which I'm discussing with you are dawning in many minds all over the world at the same time. Uh, therefore, we're all catching into that line. Now, whether you like to um, interpret that into a, an esoteric thing or not is purely up to you. If you don't, then just disregard it. But some people believe, and I'm, what should I say, gradually moving into that vein, that these concepts and these ideas are coming from somewhere else. I don't know where they're coming from, and I'm not going to sort of say. Uh, but they appear to be coming from somewhere else. And we are all like antennas, and if you're tuned in, you pick it up. So it doesn't matter whether you're a Chinese communist or an American Democrat. You pick up the same signal, and you can work along the same lines. And therefore, I think, um, as, I, as I, I've said many times, I think medicine is the greatest asset we have, because we all think similar and we're all beginning to think alike and the dividing line between holistic medicine alternative medicine advanced medicine orthodox medicine i mean all these things <coughs> are all gradually and slowly fading out and there will be only one thing and that will be healing never mind about medicine medicine always gets mixed up with drugs 
Let's call it healing. Whichever way we're doing it and whichever method we're using, let's call it healing. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, the illustration of the crab's clamps and the heart not fitting into the harmonic pattern of the body that it's placed into. Yes. Oh, yes. And what is, for example, would be the frequency band or the spectrum, uh, let's say, for resonant frequency of the heart among the many subjects that you've tested? Um, let me explain that more fully. To answer that question, I'll have yours in a moment. Uh, let me explain that more fully. Um, there is a, what we call a structural pattern for all the frequencies, whether it's lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, whatever it is, it appears. And this has only been found out by, uh, what I say, trial and error over a period of time, which is approximately 25 years we've been researching into this, that there appears to be uh, a construction pattern uh, within this field for all harmonics. And it composes basically of five frequencies. Now, please don't ask me why it's five frequencies. I haven't the least idea. I mean, a lot of people will give me a lot of wonderful answers as to why it's five. You know, the, the five, this, it's a sacred number, it's a holy number, it belongs to this. I don't know where it belongs to or where it comes from. But the point is, it is correct. There are five frequencies, but those five frequencies, if we tune them in, shall we say, what we could term straight, and that's, uh, we, if we have five frequencies just pulsing together, it will do no good whatsoever. It will only uh, fit with one person in a thousand. Over and above that, it is an irritation. There is nothing in the whole of the body which is, uh, shall we say, a static, steady movement. It all pulses. It <coughs> swings and it pulses. So the instrument which is in front of you is so constructed so that this will automatically tune it in. So therefore, if we say the first of the five frequencies is, we say, a thousand cycles per second, then a thousand cycles per second will flash through on your c small computer screen, but the instrument will attune itself before and beyond it. In other words, it'll start to pulse backwards and forwards over that 1,000 cycles per second. So sweep phenomenon, That's air right, air. it'll sweep backwards and forwards. Now, we'll also do this on the uh, th second one, third one, fourth one, and fifth one. So by the time you turn this into a harmonic, by the time the computer is turned to the harmonic, you haven't got five frequencies, but you have got five as a kind of structural pattern. Now, I think the easiest way to explain this is that if you look around at each other, you are all basically the same. I mean, you've all got a head and two arms, two legs, and a body but everyone is different. Now this is because the variation, but there is a structural pattern, and the structural pattern is the skeletal pattern which holds all the bits and pieces together. So obviously the whole of, we say, the scientific value of healing or medicine is composed of the same concise theory. There must be a constructive hold for the frequency field. Now, Instead of having five frequencies, when you've computed it and recorded it, you've got many, many times five, all pulsing, interrelating, and forming a harmonic. Now, when you inject this into the system, the body does not, I repeat this, the body does not accept the whole of that frequency field. The body is selective. It selects what it requires, and the rest is passed through. Now, the passing through of this is 100% safe because it's within the audible range. It is not in the ultrasonic range. If that was in the ultrasonic range, you would build up a heat barrier, you create damage, you create cavitation. This is why you have to be especially careful with ultrasonics. But with audiosonics, you don't. It can pass through and out the other side. In other words, it's rather like homeopathic medicine. The body will select what it requires, nothing else. The rest will pass through. Now, if you just think of this for a moment, 
This is obvious to us if we just let our minds run for a bit. We live in a world of sounds, hundreds of them, thousands of them, millions of different sounds. Some of these are extremely dangerous. Some are beneficial, some are irritating, some are annoying, some are nice, some are pleasant, some are good. But the body has to stand against all of them. In other words, the sounds will travel through your body, out the other side, and the body will reject it. If I can just step aside for a moment, uh, my wife and I have just returned from a conference of uh, medicine, they still call it medicine, in Germany, uh, which was entitled Music and Medicine. Well, we thought, well, what sort of line is this going to take? <clears throat> but what they were searching for was to see if music can be an asset in healing. Well, obviously it can, but not quite as simple as we might think. I mean, you don't sit a patient down on a nice comfortable chair and play some music and they still relapse into a somnambulistic state and of that. that is the superficial side. There is much, much more to it than that. We had to go deep in to analyze the whys and the wherefores in music. And we came out with some very, very strange conclusions. And one of them that uh, I was going to say put me up front a bit. Reference to classical music and rock and roll. Now everyone knows that the concept is taste. If we like classical music, we have a good taste for music. But if we like rock and roll and we be able to really get with it, then our tastes are rather low or they're sinking. Well now we've come to the conclusion that that is not the fact. That is not what happens. When you're in a hall of music, whether it's classical music or whatever it is, if your system and your body can align itself, requires, needs, or tolerates the frequencies which are composed within the music you're listening to, you sit there and enjoy it. <coughs> but if, on the other hand, your body does not align itself with it, you are irritated, annoyed, and you'd want to get up and walk out. Now, this is one of the reasons why, shall we say, the, uh, I'm not going to say the older, the slightly more mature people think it is fashionable and idealistic to be classical music admirers. And they will have nothing to do with rock and roll. That is only for the kids. Well, it is not quite like that. Some of the tests we ran, and we ran these a few years back now, some of the tests we had, we brought in an individual and asked them to sit in a chair and listen to music. And we had them wired up to everything we could wire them up to, to see what happened. And we had one middle-aged lady who was a schoolmistress came in and we said, what type of music do you like? Oh, she said, the classical music, Brahms, Chopin, <coughs> Mendelssohn, I said, very well. So we put it on to the speakers and she sat and listened. And we were in the control room behind the glass watching all her reactions. Well, her reactions were proving anything but tolerable to what she was listening to. Well, then, as the last few minutes, I switched the recording over to one of the pop stars singing, I can't even remember what it was, her music. And all her readings went up where they should be. So when I went into her, I said, I really apologize. I said, my hands slipped in there, and I put on the wrong music at the end. <laughs> so I said, but there's one strange thing about it. I said, all your reactions took a better look at that than they did at the classical music. Well, she sat there very quiet for a few minutes, and then she said, well, the truth is I liked that bit, and I didn't like the other. But she said, I've got to like the other, haven't I? I'm a schoolmistress, and I've got to set an example. My taste has got to be good. <laughs> well, um, to continue this further research, because I'm going off a side, and I'll come back in a moment, uh, because it is interesting. Uh, we formed a panel of uh, doctors over here in the United States and asked them to assess um, how music affected people 
And if it affected people, how and why, and what were their conclusions? Well, when we got their white paper, as they term it, back, and I glanced at it, I thought, oh, my golly. The American doctors have gone round the bend. They're halfway up the straight. Because I looked down. No, I can't remember the order it was in, but there was Tchaikovsky will affect the head. Chopin will affect the chest. Wagner, the intestinal tract. And this is the vein it went on. And I thought to myself, well, this is mad. This is crazy. This is stupid. So I put it on one side. But then I think it's that little man who gives me this poetry sometimes sort of says, well, why don't you give a second thought? So I put the varying music through the oscilloscopes to see what frequencies were to hold in it. And you know they were perfectly right. Tchaikovsky, now, any of you who are not musicians, and I mean you don't know anything about music, but I guarantee nearly all of us can say, oh, that's a bit of Chopin, or that's a bit of Tchaikovsky, or that's Wagner. We've got a pretty good idea. Now, why have you got that idea? It's quite simple, really. If you listen to Tchaikovsky, he's really up here, and he's going up into the beautiful sublime, and then he sort of comes down, and he swings back again. So that is obviously up here in the mind. And then Chopin. I mean, you know Chopin. I mean, you can imagine what he looked like, uh, and I won't go into that. Uh, but he was all sort of lovey-dovey, all down in here, you know, all in the heart and the lungs, all very nice. And then you've got Wagner. And you all remember Wagner with a whoom, whoom, whoom. Well, where on earth does that exist? But low vibrations right down in the intestinal tract down here. Now, that starts to work out why music has an effect on people. If you get kids which are still down there a bit, they want that. They want to get going with it. But if you have someone who sits around all day, reads all the nice books and listens to the nice music, he's up here, you know, with Tchaikovsky. Well, anyhow, that is what some of the vibrationary force fields can do to us. Now, there <laughs> is even more to it than that, because we have now found and discovered that not only does music register on your ears by a mov movement of air, but it also creates shape and form. So therefore, what kind of shape, what kind of form are these creating? Now, are the low vibrations creating adverse forms to the intellect of the human being? And are the more sophisticated sounds of music creating ethereal patterns if we could only see them? Our eyes can't see it. We can only hear it. Now, if we can lift the frequency of that music lift its vibrationary form and move it away from the ears and into the registration of sight, then we can begin to see music instead of hearing it. Well, this is not any hypothetical nonsense. This is an actual fact. It can be done. It has been done. <coughs> there, there's no constructive pattern in this. It doesn't do any basic good, but it is essential that we know it, we understand it, and we can realize what, ha what is happening and what is being created. So therefore, we are not only creating sound, but we are creating shape and form. Now, that bears in a complete compliance with the theory of cymatics. Here we are using sound, and that sound will create shape and form. So it is now scientifically accepted, and it's scientifically uh, acceptable to state that as the sound, so the shape, and so the form. It's a scientifically accepted fact. There's one other piece which I wanted to read to you before we go into the other bit. Organic life is continuously subjected to external forces, either to the geophysical or the metrological field of the Earth, both being the result of terrestrial and extraterrestrial forces. 
Don't misunderstand that word. We're not talking about science fiction now. I'll explain that. In many instances, both influences are so interwoven that it is difficult to differentiate between them. External forces in man can create unconscious impulses which are continually reflected in a most complicated way in the physiological processes in the body and in the actions controlled by the central and sympathetic nervous systems. The unconsciousness of these processes is the most important feature. It shows that we are continuously subjected to forces which we do not observe consciously. It is becoming an established fact now that the human being is subjected to forces which are outside of the body. The idea has always been that disease, etc., is something which is created inside the body. But we're coming to the conclusion that that is not right. Now, at this stage, please don't think I'm decrying Louis Pasteur, who founded uh, orthodox medicine or allopathic medicine, because it is time and his day and his age, I think it would be correct to say that he was in the advanced medicine field of that particular day. And he changed a theory. He suffered many slings and arrows. Uh, he always suffered brickbats too. But he stood up to it, he got through it, and because he got through it, in all probability is the reason why you and I are here. But I'm quite sure that if he was back here with us today, he would be the first to say, well, what in God's name have you been doing in the past hundred years? Haven't you advanced on my theory? Haven't you moved forward? Well, slowly and surely we're beginning to move forward. But you must realize and understand that this is not going to be an easy thing. And a lot of people will say, well, why is there a block? Why is there an obstruction between the allopathic and the advanced medicine field? It is not quite as easy as that to say it's a block. There is a very definite reason. And the reason is that so much of the theories, so much of the doctrine, so much of the understanding, so many of the concepts, if we move into this new field, will have to be changed. Now, we're not going to do that overnight. We're not going to do it in a month. We're not going to do it in a year. It's going to be slow and gradual. But slowly and surely, it's beginning to move. I mean, already, most of us who are in the medical profession hardly ever <coughs> consult the Materia Medica. It's up on the shelf collecting dust. Because nearly 75% the people that come to our consulting rooms, our offices, our clinics, and our hospitals are suffering conditions which are not in there. They're not written down. And therefore, we've got to move into this new field. And it's essential that we train people, especially medical students, into being able to understand these new concepts, because that is the world of tomorrow. That's where they'll have to be. That's where they'll have to work. And unless we prepare them for it, unless we teach them, and unless they begin to understand, they're going to be at a complete loss. Oh, it's all very well for the doctors of today, but remember, they learned most of what they know several years back. And unless they keep abreast of things that's happening, not only day to day, almost hour to hour, they've got to be able to change. This is the whole concept of science. We used, to be able, we used to be asked when we first started to postulate these concepts and theories, can you prove that scientifically? Well, now, if you think for a moment, that is rather a stupid question. Because the first thing we said to them, well, how far does your knowledge and experience in science extend? Because if it's only still in the materialistic field, Anything that I could explain to you would be useless. Well, no one gets up and asks that question now. But the word science, don't misunderstand the word science. 
Uh, as I said in the last lecture, a lot of people, when you say science and scientists, you imagine a lot of old men with long beards and white coats in secret underground bunkers building atom bombs. Well, this is not what it's about. Science, the word means an explanation of the facts and the theories in line with pleasant knowledge. That's all it means. So if you can explain the theory of which you're trying to put across, and it will align with the things that we already know and begin to understand and piece them together, then this is scientifically acceptable. That's all it basically means. It's like orthodox and unorthodox. You're as there anything just stupid in all your life. Radium was unorthodox once. X-rays were unorthodox. Washing your hands before you dealt with a patient was unorthodox. It's all got to be done the first time, and then the second time, third time, fourth time, and after you've done it dozens of times, it is orthodox. So it doesn't really make sense. We must open up to all the new things that are pouring in day after day after day. Now, in relation, let's get really back to cymatics. We know and we realize that everything has a force field. We also know and realize that we can change those force fields. <coughs> this is basically something that was, is happening to a lesser degree by the pollution, contaminated water, bad food, all these things are contributory factors to changing and altering the vibrationary field within people. So when someone comes in and they say, well, I've got an upset stomach, they've got an upset stomach as a rule because of something they've eaten. They've eaten it, they've put it into the body, the vibrationary force fields of that substance have been absorbed into the system which is contrary to it, doesn't work, doesn't function, and the system tries to fight back. And when it fights back, you're in a problem, you're in trouble. So you go along to your doctor, and very often he'll give you a bottle of medicine or some tablets. And they'll very often clear one thing and create another. I always remember Many years ago, when I was very young, my mother was a medical practitioner as well. And I always used to hear her say, in the end, I got rid of the habit. It was a hard struggle. She used to say, well, here's some tablets for your tummy trouble. Take these one before every meal. If there's any problem, give me a call and come in and see me in four or five days' time. So when they were gone out, I was an awful child, you see. And they were gone out, and I said, now, what on earth did you say that to them for? I said, don't you consider that what you have given them is something which will heal them? Well, she said, it'll heal that stomach. I said, but? She says, yes, well, but. It'll possibly give them a um, bit of intestinal trouble, a bit of constipation, perhaps a headache or something. So she said, you have to be considerate and say, well, give me a ring if there's a problem. Well, sure enough, they all, nearly all used to ring. <laughs> the tablets you gave me were marvelous. They were absolutely wonderful. Cleared my tummy up beautifully. No, no, no sign of it at all. Absolutely fine. But um, I've developed a piece of uh, constipation. Do you think you could... Uh, yes, 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 yes. We soon give you something for that. Uh, take this every morning. Now, I'm already... We're starting to treat something that we've created. We've forgotten our stomach. We're treating our intestines now. If there's any trouble, give me a call, because, you see, as doctors, <laughs> you've got to have a perfect bedside manner, you see. And if you say, well, now, if there's any trouble, you just call me or ring me, they think, you know, that's a marvellous doctor. He's so considerate, you know, I'm the only patient in his life, I think, you know. <laughs> and away they go, and invariably they'll ring up again, you see, and say, doctor, that, that's, that's cleared up my uh, constipation, it's, it's absolutely marvellous. I, um, I've got a little bit of diarrhea, though, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so it goes on. Well, now, look, the point is, 
We, this is what medicine is all about. <laughs> Very often it's these, it's these dear ladies that bring in enough money to the medical practitioner to be able to send your children to a good school. And if you cured them on the first time, it wouldn't be so good for you. But still, all joking aside, we must find another way. We must move into another field. Now, if we can do the same thing in the first instant without creating the side effects, then we've made an advance. Well, we can slowly and surely begin to do that. With cymatic induction, now, I'm going to explain these words because with all new things, we get tangled up with words. We've got medical practitioners who are calling it induction frequencies. We've got some who stick to the name cymatic therapy. We've got others who term it as transplants. Well now, it depends on your previous uh, upbringing, I think. Let's explain them. Transplant. You may think it's ridiculous, but it isn't. You're not transplanting an organ but you are transplanting the ba basic frequency or the basic pattern which causes that organ to function. So it is theoretically correct that if you put all these frequencies together, which are listed in the manual there, you could create man. Oh, you wouldn't be able to see him, but you'd certainly be able to hear him. You see, the sounds that evaluate in the tissues, the structures and the organs is so minute and so slight that you don't hear it. Imagine, well, you ought to hear this in a minute, and you imagine everyone's muscles making the sound that this is going to make in a minute. I mean, you wouldn't be able to hear yourself speaking here. Another thing that has come up, we had one lady practitioner who is very good and working with a machine, instrument rather, and she said, there's only one thing about this. And I said, well, what's that? Well, she said, some of these sounds are not nice. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm terribly sorry about that. <laughs> I said, but if you don't like it, don't write your complaint in here. I think the nearest point is to take it to the first church because God Almighty developed those, I didn't. Some of the sounds are rather strange and rather peculiar. Now, if I can just move off of that one moment to elaborate that point and that fact. Um, I said I was going to mention something about crystals, and I think this is a very good point to bring them in. Um, many of you will have heard that there is such a thing now as crystal healing, and that by the placing of crystals on the body, um, uh, we affect healing and we, we can change those frequencies by thinking about it and uh, putting thought patterns into it. Well now, I'm not going to disagree with that or by any manner of means, but I've got to stand on platforms facing orthodox people who if I say, well, you're going to blow on a crystal and think nice thoughts and you're going to implant it into that crystal, they say, why don't you go and take a running jump, you see? <laughs> so I've got to find how it does it, what it does, and if we can do it, I'm going to use the word again, if we can do it scientifically. Well, the answer is, yes, we can. Now, this took quite, again, quite a long period of time because we had to delve into the all the whys and wherefores of crystal vibration. Now, many of you who have dealt with crystals may possibly know and understand this, but the crystal is one of the oldest parts of this planet Earth. It also holds within it its primitive, basic, vibrationary form. It is strong, and it is good. But the point is, as we discussed before, everyone's vibrations are not the same. 
And what is good for one is not particularly good for the other. So supposing, just as I suppose, for instance, that we could change that vibration within that crystal in the same way as we can realign the frequency field or the resonance within an internal organ. If we can do it in an internal organ, why can't we do it in a crystal? Basically, the resonant capacities of the two are very, very similar. Well, you may not think you look like anything like a crystal, but on the other hand, the resonant pattern and the frequency field are very, very similar. Well, to cut a long story short, we found that we can. I'll give you an instance of something that happened in its early days of checking it. We were dealing with a patient who had a very serious spinal condition. And she had to come a long distance for her treatment. She treated, we treated for approximately a half to three quarters of an hour on each visit. And after the treatment, she felt good. She could walk and move and she's without pain. But she couldn't come back again within the site, what we call the cycle period of its holding capacity. I'll explain that a bit deeper in a moment. And it ran over the time before she could come back again. And when she came back again, we had lost a lot of what we had gained. Had we been able to get her closely together, we could have stabilized the condition and got her on her own capacity of resonance quite quickly and much more efficiently. But she couldn't come down except for treatment about once a fortnight or into the distance. So we took a small crystal and we placed it between two of the vibrationary fields during the time she was receiving treatment. We told her nothing about it at all. We very seldom discuss these things with the patients unless we know that they have, we say, new thought ideas or they know what we're talking about. Otherwise, they might think we're around the bend. So anyhow, we kept it there during the whole three quarters of an hour that we were treating her. And then we removed it very carefully and placed it in a small velvet bag and on a piece of cord and said to her, tongue in cheek, you know, will you wear this around your neck during the time that you're not here? Now only remove it when you get in the shower or the bath, but otherwise keep it on. She says, well, what is it? Well, I said, never mind what it is. Let's just saying you're being a little guinea pig for research. It won't do you any harm, but just to try it. Oh, all right, she said. So away she went with it, quite happy. And when she came back the next time, so she said, you know that thing you gave me? I said, yes. Well, she said, it was most odd. I said, all right, what was odd about it? Well, she said, after I left here, it felt as if I was still having treatment. She said, that sounds mad, but it felt as if I, was st I could still feel that sort of vibrationy feel in my body. And she said, and where I had it hanging round my neck, it felt warm. I said, oh, well, all right. Well, we tried again. I never explained anything to her. So we went through the procedure again, and away she went with it again. And when she came back the next time, she came in the door, she could hardly get in there fast enough, and she said, you know that thing you gave me? I said, yes, but she said it went dead, it went fat, was her expression. <laughs> I said, oh, well, what happened? She said, I don't know, but she said it didn't do what it did on the first time. I said, not at all. Oh, yes, she said, all right, when I left here. And she said, I was sitting talking to a friend, having a cup of tea, and she went into all the details, having a cup of tea, and all of a sudden, I said, oh! And my friend said, what's the matter? She says, my thing has stopped. <laughs> so I said, well, no, please tell me what you were doing. Now, this is very interesting. Well, she went into a lot of details of what she did. She took the dog out and she went shopping and she did all those things. I said, well, never mind about that. Let's skip that a bit. When you were talking to your friend, when the thing went fut, what were you doing? Well, she said, we're sitting talking, having a cup of tea. And she said, I told her about the thing I had hanging around my neck. I said, yes. And she said, uh, oh, she says, yes, that's a crystal, isn't it? So she said, well, I didn't know what it was. And she said, well, I have some of those. I'll show you. 
I said, yes. And she said she went and got the crystal. And, she ha and I said, she handed it to you and you took it. She said, yes, I did. I said, and at that moment, your thing stopped. She said, yes, it did. Well, now, this is very interesting. Because, yes, you see, this is exactly somatics. The frequency field, the resonant within that crystal, by the field existing into it, overtook at that close proximity the frequency which we had artificially created in that crystal that she was wearing. The field was stronger in the natural. We had created an artificial one, and immediately it flew back to the normal one. Now this is basically, <coughs> and the other way around, what happens with cymatics. You have created in your body, in your system, by all sorts of diverse ways, a condition which is artificial. If you've got a pain in the lung, or the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidney, you've got a pain in your head, it is not a natural thing, it is an unnatural thing, because basically it shouldn't be there. It's only your brain that's telling it you're there. Therefore, if you reinstitute the frequency field which should be there, you're creating a field, you're creating a morphogenic field. Now, the original frequency patterns are morphogenic. This is what that piece there meant, that the morphogenic field is the strongest. Therefore, if you're attempting to pull an artificial field back into the natural field, so for one of the, what does it say, almost the first time scientifically accepted, we are working not against nature, not above nature, but working with nature. So it's perfectly correct to say that this instrument works wholly and solely along naturopathic lines. It's a natural thing that we're using, not an artificial thing. We are not creating something artificial. You have a question? Oh, I think you had a question, sir. Can I answer yours, or have we gone past it? Uh, yeah. Is the uh, vibratory rate for the organs determined solely by the organs, or also by the brain? And have you determined vibratory rate?